Thank you. It is great to see all of you here at the bitter end of summer. Oh, I can't believe it's over. I've got uh, a twin three-month-old grandchildren at home and a four-year-old grandchild, and it's really nice to be here. So, <laughs> All right. Well, um, this, uh, this really began for me. I grew up in the nautical center of the universe, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And either uh, despite being landlocked or perhaps because of it, I uh, became infatuated with sailing. Uh, my grandparents had a place in West Falmouth, Massachusetts on Buzzards Bay, and they had a beetle cat on a rainbow here. And some of my first memories are of being underneath the foredeck of the beetle cat with the water sloshing and the smell of mildew. You know, it's just one of those, I guess it's a watery womb. But, um, and I, I think it was when I was 12, I did a solo sail in that beetle cat for the first time through Falmouth Harbor. And it was a sense of independence, of freedom, uh, of interaction with nature. I wasn't much of an athlete, and yet this was, it was physical in a way. I just, I just, I was, I loved it. And so, uh, pleaded with my dad to get us a boat of some kind. He built an eight-foot sailing pram which my brother and I uh, took to the, a variety of man-made lakes around Pittsburgh. Crooked Creek is one I remember, uh, Keystone Park, um, Keystone Lake, all this kind of stuff. And, um, and then they, they built a new uh, man-made lake called Lake Arthur in Butler, Pennsylvania, a little over an hour outside Pittsburgh. And this attracted a bunch of sailors, and they formed the Moraine, because it was Moraine State Park, they formed the Moraine State, State Park Sailing Club. And the, uh, the clubhouse was the public restroom beside the launch ramp. And they had thistles, they had 505s, they had 470. I mean, it was flying Scots. And they had one division that was any uh, single hand, any boat you wanted to, could sail in it. So we entered our eight foot pram. And there wasn't a lot of wind, and we were so far behind that they just told us to sail in at the end. And, and uh, my, my parents, and they had a fleet of sunfish. And my parents said, you know, would you like a sunfish? And I said, yes. My brother and I would, because Sam was crewing for me. I have a younger brother, Sam, who's two years younger than I am. And so when I think I was 13 or 14, they, we bought our first sunfish. And this was like getting in a PT boat. I mean, <laughs> this thing went, and sunfish are one of the great boats out there. They, are, they perform surprisingly well. In a blow, they can beat a laser upwind. They have a chine. That means they're not as wobbly downwind as a laser. And uh, they're, they're really a very sophisticated little boat, even though they have this Latin rig, sort of an isosceles triangle for a sail. And, um, and it was just, oh my god, this, this is what I want to do. And so... Um, we, we started racing there, and I, uh, Sam and I started doing pretty well, and um, uh, we bought a second sunfish, and, and, and soon my father and mother were thinking about racing, because my mother had grown up sailing on w West Falmouth, and she was interested in sailing, and we went to the, um, and, and in the summer of 1973, I was uh, 16 years old, and just old enough to qualify for the senior North Americans. And back then you had to qualify by finishing in the top three in a um, regional uh, event. And so it was, I remember it was in Saratoga Lake, New York. I qualified for the North Americans. And uh, Ted Moore, who was a, the reigning world champion, was there. And I, it was just, you know, for me it was, oh my gosh. Ted Moore, I read about him in Yacht Racing and Cruising. It was then One Design Yachtsman. And, um, and we went to Devil's Lake, uh, where the North Americans were. Devil's Lake, Michigan, an airless uh, Midwestern lake, exactly like the lake where I grew up on. And I ended up qualifying for the Worlds in Martinique. I was the youngest to do that. And so at 16, I had qualified for the Worlds in Martinique. And I said to my parents, are we going? And they said, yeah, you can go, but we're not going to go. It's just going to be you and your 14-year-old brother. We had never flown. We had never been out of the country. And I said, okay, sure. 
And so we went. Um, there were 102 boats. It was, um, you know, it was, and it blew like stink. I weighed 115 pounds, and the women were topless. Oh, my gosh. I mean, this was just more than I could stand. The French Olympic team was there, uh, which included Serge Maury, who had won the gold medal in the Finn class, uh, he another hero of mine. And at the starting line, these European single-handed sailors had a whole, you know, they were aggressive. They'd grab your boat and push you backwards at the start. And uh, uh, began to, re some people had paddles just to hit the knuckles of the people. I mean, this is just a whole new thing. And needless to say, I was overwhelmed. I think I ended up 64th, but it was really cool. And so then uh, the North Americans were, and, and what's interesting is I've got a book coming out in October about the year of Yorktown. It's my third book about the revolution, and it focuses on the naval battle fought between the British and the French, uh, with the French led by Admiral de Grasse. The French won the naval battle, meaning that the British could not rescue Lord Cornwallis, and we are now an independent country because of a naval battle fought without a single American participant. And so that's what this book's about. And de Grasse, when he arrived from France, arrived at, uh, at Martinique. And little did I know, I was sailing the waters that would be plied by de Grasse in the, in the spring of 17. 1781, and then the North Americans that year were in Fort Monroe, Virginia, in the Chesapeake, right at the t tip of the point formed by the James and York River, 20 miles from Yorktown. This was exactly where de Grasse's fleet was anchored during that amazing fall, and I didn't know anything about it then, but it seems like destiny now looking back. And, um, you know, and so I, I would then go on to sail on numerous other North Americans and regional championships, go to college where I majored in sailing rather than anything else. I, uh, <laughs> and, um, and that's where I, I'm, John Burnham, who spoke here earlier about the IOD class, was the captain of our team. And, um, and then uh, I graduated, and then that summer experienced the highlight of my life. It's really been downhill ever since when I won the Sunfish North Americans against 178 other uh, participants. And then I got married to Melissa, and I met Melissa uh, in West Falmouth while teaching sailing at the Chappaquoit Yacht Club. I was a summer kid. She was a townie. And uh, we got married, uh, moved to New York where Melissa was uh, uh, attending Columbia Law School, and I was reverse commuting to yacht racing, which was, which was, is now Sailing World and was then in Darien, Connecticut. And we had Jenny, our first child, here, her second year. And uh, after she graduated, we moved to Boston, and uh, that's where I was editor-in-chief of Yachting, a parody. Uh, Elizabeth Meyer of J-Boat fame was our, was our publisher. And uh, yes, yeah, a six-page article on how to walk down a dock with Robert, Robbie Doyle, is how we called him, uh, Robbie Doyle, um, show, you know, doing uh, photos on how to walk down a dock. It's really, uh, it's not politically correct, but it, it's a good testament to humor in 1984. And, um, and then uh, I was at home with the kids, and um, Melissa was the, the breadwinner. We got a house in Rentham, not far from Foxborough. Melissa was commuting in, you know, it was an hour and a half. Uh, the commute was driving all of us crazy. Her train broke down. She uh, went through everything in her, uh, in her, her case and came across Lawyers Weekly where there was an ad for an attorney on Nantucket. Neither one of us had spent any time on the island, but we looked at the map, not much of a commute. And so in the fall, <laughs> Of 1986, we moved to Nantucket without ever having spent a summer here, really literally knowing no one, with my old sunfish on the roof of our Chevy Nova. Uh, we looked like sharecroppers coming across on the Eagle, which was a brand new boat then. And the Black Water Tower was the Black Water Tower. And, um, and uh, Melissa plugged right in, uh, was soon on the board of the hospital and all this other stuff, and I was at home with the kids, feeling very landlocked. 
Uh, I was a, you know, an English major. I was still uh, nominally writing sailing articles, but Moby Dick was, had always been my Bible. And, I, that, and that, for me, that was a conduit into the history of Nantucket. And I became increasingly in, fascinated with it. And then uh, in the, the fall of 1992, Ethan went into first grade, which meant I now had till 2.30 I'd never had that length of time before. And I realized maybe it's time for me to write my, a book about the history of Nantucket, which would become a way offshore. And it was an extraordinary year for me. It was the year I found my voice as a writer. It just clicked. And I was, I was 37, and uh, I thought I was over the hill. My mother had recently asked me when I was going to grow up. And... Um, and uh, it, it, but it was all coming together. And then um, we had, it was, it, was, uh, it was actually the spring of 92, the, of that summer, and it was the America's Cup, which was at, uh, in San Diego. And I hated the America's Cup. Being a sunfish sailor, the America's Cup represented everything that was wrong with the sport. You know, it, just money, it was, about, you know, it was about equipment, and, you know, all this. And, but I was watching it on ESPN. And um, it was 5 o'clock, and that was the time for the Mickey Mouse Club. And the kids came in and said, Can we, we want to watch the Mickey Mouse Club. And I said, no, we're going to see the end of this race, really boring light air race. And uh, Jenny turned to me, and she said, Dad, get a life. And they stormed <laughs> out. And I began to think about it, get a life. So I turned off the TV, went outside. They were throwing Frisbee in our backyard. And I started playing, and I said, come here. Come, I want to show you something. And we went to the side of the house where my old sunfish was leaning against the house. And by that time, I hadn't touched it since we had moved to the island uh, six years before. Ivy was and surrounded it. Potato bugs were living in there. And, um, and I said to the kids, let's just pull it down. And I pulled it down. We, we it came, you know, had to yank it out of the, the ivy and put it down. And there were the compass headings from the 1978 North Americans. I had been unable to take them off the deck. You know, I had scribbled them in, in grease pencil. And I was looking at it. Melissa came home from work. And uh, Jenny turns to me and she said, well, why don't you ever sail it, Dad? And that's when I began to think, well, maybe that's what I need to get a life. And so Second Wind tells the story of, uh, because ultimately what I decided to do was, yeah, and, you know, here I was in a purple fit writing my first work of history, because I had only till uh, uh, May to, to write a first draft, because I was going to, I w had agreed to t be the sailing director of the Nantucket Yacht Club. And in the summer of 92, uh, we borrowed a rainbow, a beetle cat, and I was, you know, I was helping run races and all this kind of thing, and Melissa and the kids began racing, this, this beetle cat with a green sail, and they were cleaning up. I mean, they were, every Saturday they got a blue flag. And, they, you know, and, and the conversation around the dinner table was becoming nauseating. They, Jenny would say, you know, we've got all these blue flags. Can we come in second next weekend so we can get a red one? And this, you know, this is, what was driving me crazy was, that, you know, they were, in, this was a sport that had meant everything. I wanted some part of it, but here I was stuck running races and, and, and a program. And so I came up with Plan Gordon. Gordon was new to the sport. He had a uh, beetle cat. And he wasn't doing very well. It was a good boat, and he, you know, he was just new to the sport. And um, and so I, I came up to him one Saturday morning before the racing. I said, Gordon, um, would you like me to crew for you in one race just to help you? You know, pointer said, Oh, that would be great. And I said, Okay, but one thing, you're gonna. I want you to sail over to the far side of the course, and I will be dropped off, and then we'll come in. And so I helped set up the course. Uh, uh, the boys in the committee boat took me over to the far corner where I jumped into uh, his rainbow, his beetle cat, and then we sailed over uh, to the starting line. And now I'd like to read an account of the race that followed. An air horn sounded. 
indicating that we had three minutes before the start. With a familiar rush of adrenaline, I reached involuntarily for the tiller, but there was Gordon, and he needed some pointers. I told Gordon to sail over toward the committee boat. That's where Melissa and the kids were hanging out, their sail luffing lazily as Ethan dangled his hand in the blue, sun-glinting water. These guys wouldn't know what hit them. On my cue, Gordon tacked, turning us so that we crossed into the wind and ended up beside Melissa, our sail also luffing. The rest of the fleet of about five other boats was behind us, which was good as long as we didn't cross the line too early. Hey, Daddy, Jenny shouted. What are you doing out here? I chose to ignore her. I did notice, however, that her mother was looking straight at me. Melissa knew exactly what I was up to. We were down to the last 30 seconds, the most critical time, with that green-sailed beetle cat beside us. Ethan, the collar of his yellow life jacket pressed up against his chin, looked under the boat's sail. Hi, Daddy, he called out. Once again, I chose to ignore him. <laughs> Daddy, what, I finally said. How you doing? I'm doing. The starting horn blew, and in a blink of an eye, Melissa and the company were off. Okay, so I was a little late pulling in the sail, and maybe that's why they were able to surge ahead of us, but if Ethan had just not distracted me. Since sails flutter uselessly like flags when pointed directly into the wind, a sailboat must approach the first upwind mark indirectly, tacking back and forth across the course. And where a Nantucket whaleman thought in terms of weather systems and continental currents as he navigated the oceans of the world, a modern small boat racer approaches each momentary change in the wind as if it were a storm front, each point of land as if it were Cape Horn. This hypersensitivity to the elements means that the first leg of a typical race becomes a panicky, zigzag quest for the fastest path to the windward mark. And as it so happened, halfway up the first leg, we caught a nice wind shift on the right-hand side of the course and were suddenly back in contention. Gordon was doing an excellent job of steering the boat, and yet I found it impossible not to be a micromanager, offering a continual stream of advice toward the sail a little bit. Now away from the sail, that's it. The first mark of the race was a torpedo-shaped buoy anchored in the harbor channel not far from the long barrier beach known as Co2 that forms the outer edge of Nantucket Harbor. Since the entire seven-mile length of the harbor empties and fills around the end of this giant sand spit, the current there is usually quite fierce, as much as three to four knots. But all concern for the current was temporarily suspended when I realized that we were battling for first with Melissa and the kids. The conservative thing for us to do would have been to duck behind Melissa and then tack, essentially following her to the mark. But I was not about to yield. It was all or nothing. I told Gordon that with one perfectly executed tack, we could knife in between Melissa and the mark. He looked underneath the sail to see what lay ahead. What he saw obviously worried him. Are you sure? He asked. But by then it was too late. Tack, I shouted. As Gordon jammed the tiller over, I realized that I had made a terrible mistake. The tide was rushing in much faster than I had realized. Try as I might to get us moving forward instead of sideways in the current, we were soon wrapped around the buoy. There is nothing worse than being pinned against a mark in a strong tide. It's humiliating, particularly when your wife and children sail past singing, found a peanut. <laughs> There are no referees in sailing. It's up to the competitors to discipline themselves. If you commit a foul by hitting a mark or another boat or by getting in someone else's way, you can exonerate yourself by sailing one or two complete circles, depending on the seriousness of the transgression, as a penalty. It is not a funny maneuver, fun maneuver, and after disentangling ourselves from the mark and doing our penance, I apologized to Gordon. To his credit, he seemed completely unflustered by the incident. Who cared if we were now in third? We were still in the hunt with plenty of race left to sail. The wind was now from behind, putting us on a broad reach to the next mark. It turned out that Gordon's boat was fast on this point of sail, and we were able to round the next mark in second. Melissa and the kids were still quite a way out ahead. Then it happened. Suddenly, and for no apparent reason, that green-sailed beetle turned around and headed right for us. I could see Jenny up on the bow, her long blonde hair flowing back in the breeze as she pointed at something in the water, while Ethan shouted excitedly from the cockpit. Then, just before we came abreast of them, Melissa spun the boat around, the sail swooping across dramatically as Jenny plunged her hand into the water. The kids began to cheer. What was going on? Waving a sodden baseball cap in the air, Jenny explained, I dropped it overboard and Mommy went back to get it. Melissa smiled and shrugged. 
I didn't know what Gordon was thinking, but this was more than I could stand. This was a race. To turn back for a stupid hat was unthinkable, particularly when you were in first place. The implication was clear. I could do almost anything and still win. The gloves were off. We rounded the last mark, with Melissa less than a boat length ahead of us. With one relatively short upwind leg before the finish, it was time to make things happen. So we tacked in an attempt to find a shift of wind that would help us. But Melissa wasn't about to get us, get, let us get away with it, tacking almost immediately to position her sail between ours and the wind. So we tacked again, as did, of course, Melissa. It was, in the parlance of the America's Cup commentators on ESPN, a tacking duel to the death. <laughs> Beetle cats are too heavy to tolerate too much tacking, but we put our boats through their paces. Luckily, the boat in third was unable to take advantage of our infighting, and we were still neck and neck going into the finish. On board our boat, the tension was palpable. My hands trembled with excitement. Gordon's eyes blazed with competitive fire. It was a replay of the first leg. Melissa was approaching the finish line on one tack, and we were on the other. The plan, once again, was to suddenly tack just ahead of her, shoot up into the wind, and grab the victory. If it was close, I figured my boys on the committee boat would give us the nod knowing that their jobs depended on it. <laughs> I warned Gordon of the impending maneuver, and both of us were glancing toward that green-sailed menace when Gordon laughed. He laughed. Will you look at that, he cried. What, I shouted. What? Look at your son. I squinted through my salt-spattered sunglasses. Ethan was leaning against the combing of the cockpit, his head wobbling drunkenly with each bob of the boat. My God, the kid was asleep. Asleep at a time like this? Didn't he know he was in the midst of attacking duel to the death? That, I must admit, took the stuffing right out of us. Slam dunking a mother and her sleeping babe is a difficult thing to do, even if you are the husband and father. By the time Gordon and I pulled ourselves together, it was too late. The moment to pounce had passed, and when we did eventually tack, Melissa walked right over us and took the gun. The worst part was that she and Jenny didn't cheer. Otherwise, they might have disturbed Ethan. <laughs> so it was then, uh, you know, oh, man. And uh, so that fall, Ethan goes to first grade. I begin work on A Way Offshore. And as I said earlier, I was in this purple fit. And I have to say, this was, the Peter Folger was where I spent a lot of my time. And this was, this was a long time ago, and I was really the only one um, in, uh, in uh, searching through the archives. And it was a very exciting time because the newspapers had just been uh, micro filmed, and so I could work my way through the per papers very easily. The collection had been recently uh, organized in a professional manner by Jackie Herring, who was then in charge of the library. And I you know, also spent a lot of time at the Athenaeum and the town building. And it was just, you know, I, I, I didn't know enough about history to know how incredible the resources I had to work with were and how, you know, and they were all within an eighth of a mile of each other. And so I dove into this and began uh, writing the book as I do every book, chapter by chapter, working my way gradually through the history of the island. And, with, and then I just had this tremendous urge to, to start racing. And I uh, learned that the, the Sunfish North Americans in 1993 were going to be in Lake Springfield, Illinois, the land of Lincoln. And uh, it it was an airless lake, a lot like where I grew up in Pittsburgh, perfect for someone who wasn't in the shape he had once been. And um, so I decided I was going to go for it. I would train for the North Americans. But Nantucket, as you know, has the, is the windiest place on the East Coast and surrounded by ocean. Um, how do you train for it? Well, this island is blessed with uh, more than a dozen beautiful ponds. Uh, very, you know, some are sinkholes, uh, almost perfectly round. Some are very long and narrow. And so I d decided I would train by sailing a pond a weekend. Uh, that would be my training program. And so uh, this required Melissa to help me load the boat onto the roof of our Chevy Nova, which, by the way, uh, had only two forward gears. Uh, so you had to go from uh, second to fourth. And I tell you, going up Orange Street, 
um, in second. It, it, getting into it was hard. And then halfway through this winter, uh, I lost the uh, radiator. A uh, big hole developed. And I realized, who needs a radiator on Nantucket? And so I, that whole year, I drove around with a uh, dry radiator. The, the you know, panic light would go on, but not once did the engine seize on me. Anyways, to get back to this, and so I, I started sailing the ponds. And uh, it started with Gibbs Pond out by the Cranberry Bogs. It began on Columbus Day, uh, Columbus Day. You know, he be, you know, Columbus's voyage of discovery, I was setting out on mine. Uh, the uh, Sacacha Pond was opened that uh, fall for the first time in years. You know, it had been a traditional practice, but the uh, environmental people in the state said no to it. But finally, um, they relented and they opened it. And I was sailing Sacacha, actually, that, that uh, day uh, and was watched them as they opened it and was tempted. Uh, my dream was to sail through the cut. Oh, what a metaphor. Uh, but it wasn't, that for, it wasn't big enough to, to get through. And so I, I suspended that, more on that in a little bit. And then, but, you know, I'll remember Maya Comet Pond. Um, it was November, just before Thanksgiving. You know, it was, a, you know, it was colder back then. And, um, and we had the, the night before I was to, to, to sail, it was a Saturday, um, uh, it, it, the wind died to nothing and it went down to the 20s. And Melissa and I arrived and uh, it was frozen. And she said, well, I'll take, let's just go back. I said, no. And I was at a difficult point in my writing. I was going to break some ice. So um, in some disgust, she helped me launch the boat and drove off. And I took the bow and knocked a hole through the ice. It was about two inches thick and started sailing. It was like being in a toboggan uh, as you went through the ice. And uh, when I was done, I had created about a football field of broken ice. It was like sailing in a cocktail glass, the tinkling <laughs> of the ice. And so and uh, there was then on uh, Christmas stroll weekend, um, we were, that was back in the days when Santa was in the Pacific National Bank. And um, it was really cold, and uh, we were absolutely frozen after having wait, wait in line. And I realized it was, it was going to blow 30 uh, the next day. And I said to Melissa, I want to sail uh, Head of Hummock Pond, which, if, you know, that's the one at the head of the Sanford Farm. It's a, a circle with high ground around it. And um, well, Melissa said, okay. And so they dropped me off uh, while they went to Bartlett's to get a Christmas tree while I started sailing around uh, the pond. And I have to say, this was the wildest of them all. I mean, it was gusting the 30, and um, the wind... Uh, the, the, the wind was made mess by the hills. It was, and so I started doing a, a circle around the pond. It's the, the, te, the chapter title is The Jibing Hamster. And I must have done about 10 of them, I mean, really going fast on the downwind leg, jibing right where the reeds are, where uh, Head of Hummocks flows into Hummock Pond. And um, uh, the kids arrived, kids and Melissa arrived with a Christmas tree on the, on the roof, and I... Um, uh, did a heroic jibe right in front of them and then sailed right up to them and hit their bumper with my bow. It was terrific. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, I, then I began to realize, you know, wh how is this helping me train for the sunfish North Americans? And, um, and the, you know, most one design classes have the tradition of a, uh, the midwinters down, usually in Florida or somewhere like, like that. So I decided maybe uh, I'd... I'd borrow a boat or charter a boat. It was in Sarasota uh, this time. So I decided to go to Sarasota. I, you know, just give me a sense of competition because I hadn't raced since basically 1978. And so I went down there. 104 boats were there. Uh, it was, let's say, a startling wake-up call that I had a lot of work to do. And so I came back to the ponds um, with, you know, a, a renewed sense of purpose. And I got a Clorox bottle and attached it to a, uh, a old uh, the iron head of a pick that we, I found in the, the basement of our house. Attached it with some line and uh, would take that out and use it as a buoy. And I'd practice uh, mark roundings and stuff like that. And then... Um, we learned from uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Bruce Perry, who was then 
uh, working for the Conservation Foundation and uh, for the Conservation Commission, and was and they were responsible for the opening of Sackage Pond. And I heard that they had opened Sackage Pond, and I saw Bruce the night before, and he he said, "Don't, don't, you know." And I said, "Oh, great! I want to sail through the cut." He said, "No, do not do that." Um, you know, it's, he said, it's, it's raging through there. And I said, okay, I'll see. So uh, the next uh, afternoon, uh, Melissa and the kids dropped me off at Sackage Pond, you know, that, the landing that's off Pulpus Road. And you could see in the distance, you couldn't even see a cut in the distance. And, and the idea was that they would then sail over to Quidnet, the beach there, and then walk over to the cut. While, and I promised, you know, no, I'm not going to do anything crazy. And so... Um, I um, uh, went out sailing around, and there was Bruce uh, at, beside the cut going like this, don't do this. <laughs> and I could see Melissa and the kids walking from Quidnet towards there with our dog, Molly. Um, and I sailed past the cut, and holy moly, I mean, this thing was maybe, it was wide. It was really wide, and it was hauling, I mean, just hauling out. And, um, and, you know, it, 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 was, it was scary, the forces involved. And, um, and I could see the kids coming, and I said, well, what am I going to do? I'll tell you what happened next. I decided to go for it. Steep walls of sand loomed on either side. And by the way, this was um, excerpt. This section was excerpted in March uh, in my old sailing in Sailing World, and it was um, uh, the title of it. I loved this. They called it uh, Philbrick or something. Extreme sailing. <laughs> yeah, I thought, oh great, extreme sailing and a sunfish. Yeah. Okay, let's get back in the mood. Steep walls of sand loomed on either side. I'm now in the cut so steep that the sound of rushing water seemed amplified within this friable, curving moat. To my right, lodged within the sand, was the smooth, barkless shape of a tree. To my left, I saw Bruce's son, Sean, standing at the cut's edge, watching me. Hi, Sean, I yelled. He looked at me and smiled. There was a spasmodic, up-and-down motion to the waves, like the rinse cycle of a washing machine. And yet at all the time, the current was rushing me toward a bare ledge of sand, this is right at the mouth there, where huge waves from Portugal burst against the pond flow. How was I going to make it across that shoal without getting killed? It was like a scene in a Fleeny movie. Just before I slammed into the sandbar, I saw the figure of an, the elderly man hunched over and watching me silently from the left bank. Then I was hurling into the bar, yanking up my dagger board and heeling the boat to weather in a desperate attempt to keep from rounding up as the shelving sand nudged my rudder out of the water. The first wave broke across my deck and swept across the entire boat, nearly filling the cockpit. The force of the wave and perhaps a back eddy slowed the boat to the point that I just sat there, hung up on the bar as the ocean ahead coiled into a liquid wall of water. I was a sitting duck. With my dagger board and rudder all the way up, I had no steerage, and the next wave spun me around like a top. Now I was sideways to the surf. Wham! The next wave flipped me over immediately. The water was colder than I had expected and moving very fast. Beginning to panic, I struggled to stay with the boat. I thought for sure the spars had been broken like matchsticks against the sand. As the current carried me into the deep water, the boat began to turtle. A bad thing to have happen if your dagger board is all the way up. So I dived underwater and pushed the blade through the trunk. Climbing up onto the fin-like projection of the dagger board, I glanced toward the rapidly receding shore, a blank, treeless sweep of pale brown sand. Then I looked out toward the wide open sea, an empty infinity of blue that blended seamlessly with the cloudless sky. A whole new set of fears began to take hold. What if my rig had indeed been damaged? There was no way I was going to paddle my way back to the beach. I was already close to a quarter mile out and going fast. I righted the boat and was relieved to see that everything was intact, but I had my work cut out for me. Like a furiously deflating balloon, the pond was still blowing me to the east. I scrambled back into the boat, slammed the rudder down, yanked in the main sheet, and started to sail for shore. I could see Melissa and the kids on the beach waving to me. Bruce and Sean were also there. The old man had disappeared. I was now very aware of the ocean's tidal currents working on the sunfish, and I still had fears of being pushed out to sea before the eyes of my family. It was, the beat, it was a beat back to the island, and I sailed off on a port tack. The ocean swells had a slow, powerful feel to them, as if I were sailing across the gently heaving beast, breast of a giant beast. 
It was a lazy, disorienting motion. I tacked and edged over toward the cut, but the water was still wild and dangerous over there, so I tacked away, planning my final approach to the beach. Landing in an ocean swell is not easy. One screw up and a wave can smash the boat into the sand and destroy both the boat and the sailor. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, Nantucket cod fishermen had performed this maneuver in their fish-laden dories on a daily basis, and more than a few of them had been lost on this very same shore. Soon I was locked onto the face of a big comber. As I teetered on the lip of the giant wave, my mainsail flapping now that the boat was moving faster than the wind, I pulled up my dagger board and held on for dear life. It was like sitting on a boogie board with a sail on it. The wave took me right up to the beach and deposited me with an almost delicate precision at the tide line. As the waves retreated, I leapt out, grabbed the bow handle, and pulled my boat beyond the next wave's reach. It was, <laughs> it, was, it was a really stupid thing to do, but oh man, what a rush. Okay, and then I began to realize, okay, I'm, this is great. I'm, this is a cosmic venture into my soul or whatever it is. But, you know, it's kind of isolating me from my family. Uh, and for me, one of the great joys of sunfish sailing in my youth was that it all... We had four sunfish in the family. All, we all sailed together as a family. It was just terrific. You know, now kids sail opties and 420s and never the twain shall meet. I think that's terrible. I think uh, youth sailing should be one in which it's, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be Little League. It should be something where kids have role models and they see in competition. But anyways, that's me being an old fart. Anyways, so, uh, but the sunfish has a wonderful tradition. I don't know if it's still going on, but they have something called the, the uh, Connecticut River Race. You uh, sail from Hartford, Connecticut, all the way to Essex, Connecticut, right on Long Island Sound. It's a two-day event, two people per boat, and you camp halfway through there uh, at, a, at, a, at Colt State Park. It's, it's run by the Lions Club of all uh, people. They divide it into five races, and you have to have all your uh, camping equipment with you, and so you have to put that in, and we put the, everybody puts them in trash bags, and you using shock cords, you just put them on the deck. And so, I sailed with Ethan. Uh, we borrowed one of my parents' boats, and Melissa sailed with Jenny. And it was horrible weather. It was it rained, I think, more than Noah experienced. Um, I mean, it just was a deluge that first day and night. Um, but you know, we had a pretty good time, and and the, finally it cleared. And uh, Ethan and I had a terrific time because we got five firsts. And, um, but once again, what relevance did this have to racing in the Sunfish North Americans? And so once again, I, was, uh, I, had, I finished the first draft um, by June. I had to because I was once again employed as the sailing director at the Yacht Club. I would spend my spare moments in the summer uh, editing it. And in July, I went, I, I uh, flew out to St. Louis, rented a car, drove to Springfield, Illinois, where I chartered a boat. And I will not tell you how that went, because that's why you have to read the book. <laughs> Let me just say, I did not embarrass myself. Um, and it was um, really kind of cool. And, uh, and one of... One of the things that made it special is when I was a kid, when I was racing uh, as a, in my teenage and 20s, there was one guy who was pretty much almost exactly my age, Paul Fendler. Uh, he was from Rye, New York, and yet he also qualified for the Worlds in Martinique. Um, you know, he'd beat me, I'd beat him, you know, it was that kind of thing. And for reasons none of us can figure out, he came back to the class on, at Springfield. It was amazing, and he hadn't sailed uh, in years either. So anyway, so it was, a, it was cool, but then the fall came, and you know, my sunfish was back to leaning against the foundation of the house. The kids were back in school. I was now um, in the final stages of preparing the manuscript uh, for publication. Melissa was back at work. It was October, you know, the best month of the year on Nantucket. And um, you know, but what was going on? You know, what was happening? Then it was about uh, 2 o'clock. I get a, it was in the, a, a weekday afternoon. I got a call from Melissa. I never got a call from Melissa. She was always so busy working. And she said, hey, it's a beautiful afternoon. Uh, by this time, we owned that beetle cat, and we had moved it to Pulpus Harbor for the fall. And she said, what if I come home um, and 
you know, I'll draw, uh, actually she was going to meet us in Pulpis and we'd get the boat rigged up and we'd all go for a sail. And so I said, wow, okay, sure, we'll do this. And so I, the kids came home, gave them their, their snack, and we drove down to Pulpis. We had a Coleman um, canoe, which we donated to the Massachusetts Field Station. Apparently, they, uh, they still have it. It's still there, and they call it Nat. Um, if so if you ever want to borrow it, it's still there. But that was our tender, and we paddled out to the Beetle Cat. Uh, Jenny uh, left Ethan and I rigging while she went back to pick up Melissa. We, uh, our dog Molly was with us, and we set off for an afternoon sail in October in Pulpus Harbor, uh, made our way out of the harbor, and you know one of the great um, tidal marshes, I think, is the Pacomo, uh Madawi Creek area. And um, I had in, in that uh, previous fall, I had sailed into there in a sunfish, literally no wind and rain. It was just very, very sort of metaphysically dour experience. But this was completely opposite. We were all together in the, sun fi- in the, in the beetle cat. And, and one of the things I was curious about this whole endeavor was that, um, you know, when you're really into a sport, you, you know, and, they, and uh, all sports have it. There's something called the zone. You know, when you figure it out, when it's instinct, you're not even thinking and it's, it's clicking, you know. And, uh, and you know, when I, that summer when I was 22, I could, you know, slip into the zone almost at will. And my question was, could I do that again? And, um, and, and I would like to end tonight by reading... Uh, the last few paragraphs with which, uh, from the epilogue with which the book ends. Uh, so, eventually the creek's convolutions terminated at a wide tidal pool, a pond surrounded by a perimeter of marsh grass and a few houses. This was the destination I had been unable to reach in the rain last November. Now I was here in the yellow light of an October afternoon, and instead of being alone in a sunfish, I was with my family and the beetle. With Jenny and Ethan up on the bow, to keep the rudder out of the mud, and Melissa playing the centerboard, I sheeted in the sail and began the long beat back. Soon we were tacking on an almost continual basis, the kids dancing around the deck like ballerinas as we swooped from bank to bank. We'd emerged from the creek and begun to turn toward Pulpus Harbor when I realized that Melissa and I were still sailors. Even after all these years, even after jobs and children, we still found joy in simply being together in a sailboat. If there was one thing I'd learned in my comeback year, it was that there is no such thing as a single-handed sailboat. Even, as, even in a sunfish, I needed my family, my friends, and yes, even my dog. When it came to sailing, I had lost the zone. Even when I was at my best in Springfield, I was too aware of my past, of having done it before. The zone is not a place for looking back. It requires a fierceness, a single-minded commitment to the moment that I could no longer sustain. This didn't mean that I was all washed up. As I'd proven at the North Americans, I could still win a sailboat race. But if I'd lost the illusion of mastery and control, at least I was no longer landlocked. I was sailing again on an island that was beginning to feel like home. Now I understood. From a pond on Nantucket, to a bay in Florida, to a river in Connecticut, to a lake in Illinois, my comeback had always been leading me here, to a crowded sailboat on an island harbor, 24 miles out to sea. Thank you very much.